Hey everyone. Uh, so today is going to be um, the final lecture that we have for the course. Um, and then we'll spend um, the final couple of weeks um, letting you guys uh, make your presentations and having a chance to really talk and um, discuss your projects. Um, and as I mentioned last time, you know, uh, even though we have a fair number of people enrolled in the course that given that lots of you guys are working in groups we will actually have you know um, plenty of time to discuss um, each of the projects and so please plan if you can um, to make it um, to um, to the live classes the next couple of weeks and um, I think it'll be really uh, fun to see what everybody has been up to in terms of applying these methods um, to their own research. Um, but today we're going to kind of make a full circle and talk about a really recent literature on taking uh, the transformer and applying it back to the computer vision task that we saw at the beginning of the class. Um, and we're going to talk about some really recent papers. This is probably not something that's like really ready for prime time in terms of you easily being able to implement it for your own work, but by next year at this time that may have totally changed. Um, and so this is like a good literature um, to, to keep an eye out on. Okay. Um, and wait, sorry. Okay. 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 Um, so, you know, a theme that we've seen in talking about NLP is that the transformer architecture has really um, changed the landscape of modern NLP. You can go and look at all the different NLP benchmarks, you know, on papers with code, um, and you'll see that pretty much um, all of them are dominated by models with uh, transformer architectures. And so this is just really, one of the papers that just, you know, really changed an entire field. Um, and so, you know, as we've talked about conceptually, the reason for this is, first of all, because you can get these robust contextualized uh, representations as a result of self-attention. Um, and then the other thing that is really powerful about it is being able to just parallelize training across compute nodes. Um, and so you can train a massive model on like an insane amount of data and have a massive number of parameters. And you can do that because the whole thing can be parallelized across the like, you know, a thousand plus GPUs that Facebook AI research has, or that, you know, Google has. Um, and, you know, so we saw examples where you could put self-attention into an LSTM and it helps, but not as much as, you know, having the transformer, which you can just train a much larger model. Um, and kind of interestingly, you know, like ex ante, I think like most people would have thought that there were going to be like, you know, decreasing returns to, to marginal returns to scale at some point that you should see kind of this improvement with model size leveling off, but that's not really been the case. Um, you still get, you know, better returns, just making even bigger models, even though the biggest models now have many billions of um, parameters. And so that means like transformers essentially are very scalable. If you have more data and more compute, um, you can use them to estimate a better model. Um, and so you might think that this would be kind of really applicable to computer vision tasks too. And if you think about kind of the ComNet like paradigm that we use for computer vision, that's not really how human vision works. It's not like you see a scene and you scan the entire scene with these, you know, like convolutional filters and then process it. Like humans are very good at paying attention to like certain salient things. Um, and so you might think like this really, like this really makes a lot of sense, like in the context of vision um, and, you know, being able to parallelize things is always um, great. Um, and um, so, you know, indeed, um, you know, there has been a very recent literature thinking about, well, how would we take this architecture and apply it to, to vision problems where the inputs are sort of fundamentally different. And it's not like a sequence of text, uh, but this kind of multi-dimensional um, image. And um, 
so like if you were to have that that could be just really useful you might think well maybe this paradigm where you know it, it takes a huge amount to pre-train these models so it's google that pre-trains it but then you can fine tune it relatively easily on your kind of own data set that might be kind of useful for vision as well um and so people have been working on this um just um very recently like you know the papers we're going to talk about are like within the past six months um and um so you know it's not trivial to think about how to take this model that was kind of developed in the context of machine translation and think about applying that to images. And so you're going to have to have some adjustments to the architecture, um, some adjustments to kind of how you think about going about training this. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about how the transformer has been modified and repurposed uh, to accomplish um, you know, good performance on image classification and object detection, um, which are the core, you know, computer vision tasks that we've discussed in this course. Okay. And so first of all, I want to talk about um, using transformers for image classification, which is kind of the ultimate um, benchmark task in computer vision. Um, and so, um, in particular, we're going to talk about a paper from about uh, six months ago called An Image is Worth 16 by 16 Words, Transformers for Image Recognition at Scale, um, that was released by researchers at uh, Google um, that um, was able to do pretty well on benchmark tasks um, by applying a vision transformer architecture to image classification. Um, and so they called their model the vision transformer, um, and they were able um, to achieve a state-of-the-art image classifier um, using only a transformer-based architecture. It was not combined uh, with CNNs um, to extract features uh, from image inputs. Um, they also had a hybrid model um, that incorporates CNNs into their architecture, um, and that model kind of performs about the same. Um, and so um, this model did reasonably well. If you look at it now today, like six months later, it's number six um, on ImageNet, number two for CIFAR 10, remember was like there's images in 10 categories and CFR 100, um, you know, it's still kind of slightly be out by CNN architectures, but it shows a lot of promise. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit into um, how the architecture of this, um, of this uh, VIT visual transformer uh, model works. Um, and so the goal of the paper is to be able to apply like a standard transformer to images um, with the fewest possible modification. Um, and so in order to do that, you need some way to translate an image, which you know is gonna be this like three-dimensional object, right? Um, into something that's analogous um, to um, the inputs of BERT. And so it does this, by splitting the image into fixed sized uh, patches and embedding these passage, patches um, into um, a um, embedding vector, just like Bert takes um, word tokens and sends them to an embedding vector. Um, with the visual transformer, now the unit of you know, embedding is not the um, word token, but it's these like patches um, out of an image. Um, and in order to do that, it takes the patches and turns them into like a one dimensional sequence. Um, and then, um, you know, it has a learned representation um, for embedding them. Um, and just like in BERT, like if you just did that by itself, you lose all the positional information. Like, okay, this patch is from the, top right corner and this patch is from the middle and the center and this patch is from like the bottom left corner 
And so um, it adds position embeddings to the patch embeddings and those position embeddings are also going to be uh, learned. Um, and so this part is also actually quite analogous to the transformer in NLP. Um, okay. And um, so treating an image as a sequence of patches, um, you know, may seem obvious, um, but um, wasn't the first thing that people tried. Um, sort of earlier attempts to work with image transformers um, tried to work with pixels, um, but they had a hard time because this is like, it's quadratic, right? And the number of pixels to have kind of self-attention over that. And you're gonna run into kind of the same problems that you run into with larger sequences. Um, but images just by their nature, you know, have um, a lot of pixels in them, right? Especially if you wanna do something like object detection that, you know, requires a high resolution image. And so just in practice, it didn't really scale well, well to have global attention to every pixel in the image because that's just um, too, too large of a problem. Whereas with NLP, you know, having like a, you know, a, just a, a sequence of 512, um, you know, was, was reasonable. Um, and so people tried to do things like sparse attention and stuff, but you know, that has its own kind of set of issues. And so um, patch-based embeddings allow for there to be global attention to the full size image because you're not treating the image as a series of pixels, but treating it as a series of um, patches. Um, and in the hybrid version that has a CNN, rather than taking the patches from the original image, you take them from that CNN features map. Um, but as I said, this doesn't really make a big difference to performance. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, once you have the inputs like compatible um, with the transformer, the rest of the architecture is kind of very similar to the standard like transformer encoder architecture that we saw in BERT and other BERT-like models. And so it consists of alternating layers of multi-headed self-attention, um, just like you have in BERT, and then these multi-layer perceptron blocks um, that use a layer normalization, kind of again, like just like we saw in BERT and that use residual connections, you know, also like we saw in the kind of in the original transformer, those residual connections help ensure good gradient flow and they use something called um, JLU uh, non-linearity. Um, and so this is, um, this is the uh, visual transformer architecture. And as you see, it's very kind of um, very reminiscent of the original transformer. You normalize things, you have multi-headed attention, you have those skip connections, and then you normalize again for a multi-layer perceptron with another um, skip connection there. And so um, the um, GELU Gaussian air linear unit um, is essentially like, you know, similar to ReLU and the exponential linear unit, you know, the other um, nonlinearities that we talked about kind of in more depth um, earlier um, in uh, the course. And it's also used in like BERT and in GPT. Um, and so it's just kind of, you see in this uh, graph, it's a kind of a slight uh, variation on the nonlinearities that we have seen before that's used in transformer architectures. Okay. And so um, the tokenized or the patched uh, patches of the image um, are then embedded, uh, you know, they become these embedded input sequences and you pass them through the transformer encoder um, and uh, the output um, class token is attached to a classification head um, that is just going to be like a multi-layer perceptron um, with a hidden layer at pre-training time and a single layer at fine-tuning time. And so again, like much like in BERT, you know, the output of this classifier is going to come um, from that class token, just like you could train 
like a classifier in BERT and fine tune it to do like topic classification or sentiment classification using that class token. And so this is, um, you know, a picture of what this um, architecture looks like um, from the paper. And so you see there's like the, um, the image is divided up into uh, patches and um, those patches are embedded um, and they are also added to a position embedding. And then that goes through this, you know, series of transformer encoder blocks. Um, and then ultimately there's a um, classification head um, that tells like what class um, the image belongs to. And um, so they have different sizes, um, a base, a large, and a huge. Um, and the large, the, you know, the huge version has um, over 600 million parameters. Um, and so, you know, another thing that you have to worry about is, okay, well, this is the architecture, um, but how do we train this model? Um, and what they find is that, like, if you just train it on ImageNet, which is kind of the standard in this literature, it actually is, is not as good as, like, you know, ResNets of comparable size, like, trained on ImageNet. So it's still kind of getting... Um, beaten out by the ComNet um, architecture, um, you know, which might seem kind of um, discouraging. Um, but then what they find is that if you train it on an absolutely massive data set, like on 300 million images, um, that um, then it's able to achieve kind of that performance that's comparable to or better than, um, you know, the, the ResNet. Um, and um, so what this means is that if you want this architecture to achieve state of the art performance, it has to just be pre-trained on an absolutely um, massive, um, you know, amount number of um, images, um, which, you know, is, is a challenge because, you know, as we've seen in the vision literature, this is, it's mostly supervised, right? Like people are pre-training on ImageNet, that's, um, you know, 14 million images that were created by human annotators, right? Um, and so like it's different than an NLP where like language modeling is this unsupervised thing. You just, if you can scrape a massive amount of text from Wikipedia or from the internet or wherever, essentially without human cost, you have like a massive amount of data to train it on. And so um, the authors, uh, pre-trained the visual transformer on this JFT 300 million, which is an internal Google data set. So it's probably like not an accident that this paper was, you know, written by researchers um, at Google. And then they'll like fine tune it downstream on like um, ImageNet. Um, but yeah, to achieve this kind of state of the art performance, it does take this like, you know, massive um, amount of, of data to pre-train it on. Um, and so, you know, these are the results. And so it's comparing the different sizes of their models to ResNets of different sizes, which are like the grays. And you can see kind of at the higher end, um, it's slightly uh, with the larger models, it's sort of slightly beating out ResNet with like a similar number of parameters. Um, and um, so if you hold compute fixed, it's also pretty computationally efficient to run. Okay. And um, so the authors also try out a self-supervised pre-training regime um, that they call a masked patch prediction, which is kind of more similar to how language models like BERT are pre-trained. And so in masked patch prediction, 50% of patch embeddings are corrupted. And some prediction about the corrupted patches is made, like what's their mean color, um, you know, et cetera. Um, and um, so the performance of the self-supervised model on ImageNet classification 
is slightly worse than the supervised model, um, but it requires a data set much smaller than this massive Google JFT data to get similar performance. And so this is potentially, you know, a kind of a path forward in the future is thinking about like how you can have self-supervised training of, you know, image classification that would allow you to really train on a massive like amount of data without having to have that kind of massive amount of human labor to create, you know, human annotated data. Um, and, um, so, um, you know, in the paper, they try to kind of do a dissection of what's happening. Um, and they show um, that um, the visual transformers learns the grid-like structure um, for the position embeddings. Um, and so remember those position embeddings are kind of learned and this is like what they look like. Um, and then they also try to look at where um, it's attending to, to see if this kind of makes um, sense. And indeed you see in these um, images here that it appears to be attending to the part that has the object that is the image classification. So in a picture of the airplane, it's attending you know, to the airplane, um, which is um, a, a good thing. Okay. And you know, so the general takeaway is that, you know, it's possible to achieve um, state of the art or close to state of the art performance on image classification tasks, you know, with this transformer based architecture. And this shows a lot of promise because this literature is kind of very, very young, whereas it's been kind of, you know, eight years um, since AlexNet. And so, you know, people have been working on perfecting the ComNet like architecture kind of for a long time. And so I think that um, this is an area that you're gonna see kind of more progress on. And the biggest challenge now is just needing massive amounts of data um, to um, pre-train and transformer. So maybe kind of more advances in how we think about having a self-supervised training objective um, would kind of help this literature to move forward. Um, are there any questions at all about the visual transformer before I talk about um, another paper in this literature? Okay. So kind of even more recently than the visual transformer, there's been um, another model called the data efficient image transformer, um, which you know is kind of um, responding to how uh, data hungry um, that uh, transformers are to train. And so it essentially has the same architecture um, as the visual transformer, but thinks about like, is there a way that this, that the, the visual transformer can be trained kind of much more efficiently as opposed to, you know, needing this massive amount of data and massive amount of compute. And um, so there's like two main ideas behind it. Um, and so the first is to use a distillation procedure to train a high performing small version of the VIT. And so this is like the same thing that we saw, you know, essentially with the NLP transformer, um, you know, we talked about um, Distilbert, um, you know, Google and other search engines are, are BERT driven, but they're not computing like full BERT when you type something into the Google search bar, they're using distillation, right? So distillation has been kind of very important um, in language um, transformer NLP. Um, and the idea is to kind of do something um, similar here. And then they also do some data augmentation on ImageNet um, to try to get just like more mileage out of it and do more kind of hyperparameter search, um, you know, to try to find a way to get the image transformer to work without needing, you know, such a massive, um, you know, model and massive amount of data for pre-training. Because, you know, as we saw before, the visual transformer only really started to achieve state of the art when you use the largest version of it, you know, trained on the most data. Um, and so the data augmentation stuff that they do is like 
pretty standard, like, you know, rotating, cropping, shearing, translating, changing contrast. Um, and um, so, um, you know, what's a little bit novel, more novel is taking this distillation that's very common in, um, in NLP and thinking about how you would apply that um, to vision tasks. Um, and so essentially with distillation, if you recall from when we talked about it before, you have this student model um, that um, you know, you're trying to get that student model to match kind of the performance of a much larger model, which is called like essentially the teacher network. Um, and um, the, student, the student model is trying to learn to produce results of similar quality to this much larger like teacher model. Um, and you know, it uses something called the Kolbeck Leibler divergence um, uh, between the softmax of a teacher model and the softmax of a student model. So that's called soft distillation, which is typical. Um, hard distillation, instead, you try to minimize the cross entropy between the teacher highest probability prediction and the student um, highest probability prediction, and that's your objective. Um, and so this, um, you know, um, uh, model um, tries out both the hard and soft distillation um, to, um, you know, to see how they work. Um, and they do this essentially um, by using a novel distillation token, which is another learned embedding, kind of like the classification token is a learned embedding. And during knowledge distillation-based training, um, it is the output derived from the distillation token, um, which communicates with the rest of the model inputs through self-attention that is used for the knowledge distillation loss. Um, and you know they find that this is um, that this is uh, useful. Um, and so this is um, you know an example of um, what this architecture essentially looks like. Um, and so by training smaller models that they achieve through um, through knowledge distillation. Um, and, you know, also combining that with their data augmentation and looking more carefully for hyperparameter optimization, et cetera, they're able to achieve classification performance that's only slight below, below um, uh, state of the art. Um, and, you know, so this is like um, potentially um, important as well um, in that, you know, NLP kind of like transformer based NLP wouldn't have had near kind of the influence it has if like Google wasn't able to use like a distilled version of BERT um, to like serve your Google search, et cetera. Um, and essentially like this paper is showing that you can do something, um, you know, essentially similar with the visual transformer architecture and have a model that kind of has similar performance, but is like smaller and just easier to deal with than the massive, you know, 800 million, you know, visual transformer model that actually achieved performance similar to a ResNet. Um, okay, um, so a final paper, that I wanted to mention that's gotten a lot of attention, it's even more recent, just came out this February, is called a transformer in transformer. Um, and um, it does um, pretty well um, on ImageNet um, with similar computational cost um, to the, the models that we just saw. Um, and so it does this by using an inner transformer block to model pixel level relationships within patches through attention um, as a form of local feature extraction um, that maintains spatial structure within patches and then has an outer transformer block to uh, um, extract features across passage um, through attention just as in um, the um, visual transformer model. And so essentially it's like a tran transformer blocks inside transformer blocks. And so that it can 
you know, attend across pixels within these smaller patches um, and then um, also have a tension that goes across patches. And so in some sense, the intuition for this is like similar to the attend to, to the intuition we saw with something like, you know, XLNet, um, where you can have these attention leakages across different, um, you know, um, batches of input um, into the um, into the transformer. And so we're not going to go into too many um, details about this, but this is just um, what the architecture looks like. So you're still dividing it up into patches and attending across patches, but then you also have these pixel level embeddings and you have attention within the patches to preserve kind of the very local, um, you know, spatial information um, in the image. And I think that this is like a promising um, architecture that you'll see more development done to as well. Okay, so that's um, transformers for image classification. Are there any questions about that? Okay, um, and so I'll then talk briefly about transformers for object detection, which is the other, um, you know, main task that we talked about in the computer vision portion of the course. Um, and so image transformers are also now kind of being developed for um, object detection. Um, and they actually, you know, predate um, some of the work um, that has been done uh, for image image classification, um, but they did still kind of use a CNN backbone, uh, much like, you know, mask our CNN, um, and thus it wasn't really like a full transformer-based approach, um, but rather using transformers to replace everything except the CNN backbone um, for object detection. Um, but recently, um, there is an object detection model that entirely uses transformers for feature extraction um, called SWIMT, or sorry, SWINT. Um, and so, um, you know, if you go to papers with code, uh, SWIMT is listed as state of the art for object detection um, and has kind of the highest performance um, recorded on the COCO um, object detection data set, which is sort of the main um, benchmark um, for object detection. Okay. And so um, with this uh, SWIN transformer, um, the transformer like um, is the backbone for doing object um, detection. And so it is essentially a hierarchical transformer whose representation is computed within shifted windows, which is where the SWEN uh, comes from in the name. Um, and so it's aiming to solve the problem of generating multi-scale features um, from high resolution images using transformers, which is a key component of doing good object detection. So if you remember back when we talked about object detection features, pyramid networks were really central part of achieving high performance um, because you have objects of different scales uh, within an image and you need ways to extract um, those objects, those multi-scale objects from your image. And so there's no really analog of that, you know, to a features pyramid network um, in the transformer architecture. And you're gonna need that um, to do successful object detection because, um, those feature pyramids are central to being able to extract objects that in your image that have different resolutions. Um, and um, so it's also trying to address the vision transformer seeming incompatibility with doing something like semantic segmentation, which remember is like at the pixel level. Um, and um, because, you know, visual transformers um, is, um, you know, working at the patch level. So it's not going to be able to do pixel level predictions for something like um, a semantic segmentation that we saw. Okay. 
So Swin T creates a hierarchical multi-skill representation of an image that's essentially analogous to a multi-skill feature pyramid um, by first performing self-attention on small patches of an image only within local windows of the image, and then merging neighboring patches and performing windowed self-attention on these new larger patches um, and continuing this pattern through the depth of the transformer layers. Um, and so this is, um, you know, essentially showing um, what that architecture looks like. And so you can see that it's kind of very reminiscent of a features uh, pyramid where, you know, it's, um, you know, attending first of all within like the small patches and then aggregating as you go up um, through the network in a way that's very analogous to feature pyramid, whereas in the visual transformers, there's like no concept of a features pyramid. You're just taking the patches kind of from the very beginning as the unit and just um, passing those like through the full trans set of transformer blocks. Okay. And so each stage of the SWIN transformer is composed of multiple transformer blocks um, that produces something that's akin to a features map. Um, you know, which can be used essentially to create a features pyramid network um, and or as a backbone for, you know, a model like analogous to like mask or CNN. And um, for Swinty, the number of patches in each window is fixed and thus complexity is going to be linear in image size. Um, and so, you know, this is showing you that architecture where they're stacking these um, you know, multiple transformer blocks um, and um, changing the, um, the patch resolution. And so um, the authors of the paper show that one of its most important design choices is to perform windowed self-attention over windows that shift in spatial extent across alternating layers. And so they say the shifted window partitioning approach introduces connections between neighboring non-overlapping windows in the previous layer and is found to be effective in image classification, object detection, and semantic segmentation. You know, it increases the model's downstream performance on all tasks. And so shifted windows are different than like the sliding windows that we saw before where you have a window and you're kind of moving it across um, uh, the full image. Um, and um, so in short, like this is kind of what the, the shifted windows look like. Um, and so you have these and you are shifting them around kind of at each layer of the transformer. So you're only attending within these windows of a certain fixed size at this stage, but you're changing kind of what those windows are. And that's allowing you to get kind of better um, exposure to different neighboring features um, in the image, even if in kind of like um, layer L, it happened to like be in the next patch over, but in layer L plus one, you kind of shift those windows around and now it's kind of in that same patch and you can attend to it. Um, and so essentially by applying transformer self-attention at multiple scales, it's able to extract rich features from high resolution images in a way that's computationally efficient. Um, and that helps it to do you know, pretty well on the um, uh, COCO object detection task. Um, and so you know, essentially the paper argues um, that it's um, pushing computer vision methods and models even closer to NLP methods and models and, you know, argues that, you know, they're trying to encourage a unified modeling of vision and language signals. Um, and so in the models that we've seen today and these architectures, it's clear that concepts like representation learning, um, you know, um, are making the entire uh, deep learning space um, more unified. Um, and this has just been a general trend. And so if you go back to like the 2000s and the era of like kind of features engineering, there were like, you know, computational linguistic people who were like 
experts at language who engineered all these models using like, you know, semantic features of specific languages. And if you did NLP, you were like a computational linguistics person. And if you did vision, you had like a totally different background. Um, and we've seen these literatures just get pushed um, closer and closer together. Um, you know, through like the the advances that that, that we've been talking about here. Um, I mean, in some sense, even if you're using ComNets and um, Vision versus the Transformer and NLP, like at its core, it's like you know matrix algebra and like multivariable calculus, and just through this kind of unifying like you know framework of you know deep neural networks that's pushed these fields much closer together. So you can have people who are making important contributions in NLP who are also making kind of major contributions to um, the vision research frontier. And even though like ex ante, like NLP and vision may seem like very different tasks at the core of each of them is being able to make a good representation that you can use to perform like downstream tasks. And we really were seeing these um, fields converge. And I think that we'll see them probably converge even more um, as the transformer architecture potentially comes to kind of dominate um, vision as well. Um, and there's also other models like, you know, that we haven't had a ch chance to talk about, um, but models that will do things like image captioning, um, you know, where um, you feed it an image and, um, you know, it, it produces a caption for that image or um, like, um, image classifiers where you feed it an image and the output is actually a text um, and um, that are also kind of pushing this, um, you know, intersection between computer vision and NLP. Um, and um, so this is, um, this is pretty cool and it, it's great for us because <laughs> it's that much less to learn. If we wanted to learn how to do computational linguistics in like 2005, it doesn't work that well. And it would be hard to do all of that, like, you know, in a single course and these models like work better and at their core, they're actually kind of simpler. They take a lot more compute to train, but it's easier, you know, to kind of, to have the knowledge to be able to actually implement them. And so that's, um, that's really great for us. Um, so that's all I have. Are there any questions at all about visual transformers or about applying them?